We all have questions about the meaning of life. In a world where everything is constantly changing, is there anything that stays the same? In a culture that sells the news, is there any story worth believing? In a society that values things that are new, can anything old remain relevant? The Bible contains truths that are as old as human consciousness. Some of the world's earliest written records and oldest oral histories are contained within its pages. Although the scriptures were written in another time and context, we believe that through the Bible, God still speaks to us. This ancient collection of texts is still alive as the Holy Spirit inspires us in its reading and teaching. Do you like my mask? Yeah. You know, <laughs> what's that, Jaron? <laughs> What'd you say? You look with it. Oh, thank you. Jaron said it's an, it's an, it's, he says it's an aesthetic upgrade. It's, it's, it's a, that's Jaron's commentary on the, on the mask. You know, everybody's uptight these days about the mask. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if, if, we, if we can't laugh, we're in a really bad place. You know, have some fun with it, you know? They don't want us uh, buying the, uh, the really expensive, like, N95s and stuff because the medical professionals need them, so there's kind of no regulation on masks. Have fun with your mask, you know? Do something, do something fun with them. I'm not here to talk about masks, but I do understand that it's a, it's a, it's a topic that is, you know, taboo. So, hey, we're in church. Church is a place you talk about stuff that's taboo. Because if you can't talk about it in church, where can you talk about it, you know? It's all right. It's all right. I got a question for you today. Here's the question. If you could ask God for just one thing that you knew he would grant that request, what would it be? I'm serious. If you could ask God for just one thing, what would it be? Money? Health? More children, less children. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> children are a blessing from God, they are. Seriously, if you could ask God for just one thing, what would it be? There was a man in the Bible that was given this opportunity. Do you know this story? Uh, it's the story of Solomon, the son of David. David, the man after God's own heart. David, the one who had killed Goliath with a slingshot. David, the one who penned so many of the Psalms. His son Solomon had to follow in his footsteps. And God came to him with a challenge of sorts. Ask me anything. We're gonna read that story together. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to 1 Kings. We're gonna go to 1 Kings chapter three and I'm gonna read a lot and I'm gonna keep moving because we got a lot of, a lot of ground to cover today. And we got to get out of here before 1045, because there's another service at 1045, you know. So this is 1 Kings chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to start in verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and, said, and God said, ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, you have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. Although I am only a little child, I do not know how to go out or come in. And if your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so, numer so numerous they cannot be counted. I, I read that poorly. Your servant is in the midst of your people. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. Okay, here's what he asked for, an understanding mind to govern your people. 
able to discern between good and evil. For who can govern this, your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. So God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Now I, now I do according to your word. This is interesting. God's, God's doing according to somebody else's word. This could be a commentary on prayer. It might become that later in the message. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare with you. If you will walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your life. Then Solomon awoke. It had been a dream. He came to Jerusalem where he stood before the Ark of the Covenant, covenant of the Lord. He offered up burnt offerings and offerings of well-being and provided a feast for all his servants. Later, two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, please, my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. Uh, apparently, they're a part of the same brothel. And I gave birth while she was in the house. Then, on the third day after I gave birth, this woman also gave birth. So they have children very, very close in age, three days apart. Then, this woman's son died in the night because she lay on him. Very tragic. She got up in the middle of the night and took my son from beside me while your servant slept. She laid, him, she laid my son at her breast and laid her dead son at my breast. When I rose in the morning to nurse my son, I saw that he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning, clearly it was not the son I had born. But the other woman said, no, the living son is mine and the dead son is yours. The first said, no, the dead son is yours and the living son is mine. So they argued before the king. Then the king says, he was Jewish, right? Oy vey, <laughs> right? The one says, uh, this is my son that is alive. And your son is dead, while the other says, not so, your son is dead, and my son is the living one. So the king said, bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. The king said, divide the living boy in two and give half to the one and half to the other. He doesn't sound very pro-life, at least at this moment. But the woman, the woman whose son was alive said to the king, because compassion for her son burned within her. Please, please, my Lord, give her the living boy. Certainly do not kill him. The other said, it shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king responded, give the first woman the living boy and do not kill him. She is his mother. All Israel heard of the judgment that the king had rendered and they stood in awe of the king because they perceived they perceived that the wisdom of God was in him to execute justice. Wisdom. He could have asked for anything. Solomon could have asked for anything, and he asked for wisdom. The heading in many of our texts uh, in our Bibles says something like, Solomon asks for wisdom. It's because this word wisdom sums up the spirit of all that Solomon asked for in asking for discernment and understanding. He asks for wisdom. Wisdom, chokmah in Hebrew, Sophia in Greek. Wisdom is the elusive character that the book of Job describes so eloquently. In the Old Testament, wisdom is a, is a force in the universe, comparable in, in ways to the logos that John talks about when he opens up uh, his gospel. In Proverbs 3, the Bible tells us that God founded the earth in wisdom. Jeremiah 10, 12 says, God established the earth by his wisdom. Now throughout the Bible, wisdom is, awful, is often coupled with knowledge. And wisdom and knowledge are not mutually exclusive, but they do have very different characters. And I wanna spend some time on this difference today. The difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is information. You go to college to get some more 
Knowledge, right? Wisdom, however, is discernment. Knowledge is concrete data. Wisdom, however, is elusive and abstract. Knowledge is a, it's a flood of facts, but wisdom is the ability to parse them out, to separate them. Knowledge is static. It's unchanging. You can quantify knowledge. You can know all there is to know about a finite thing. But wisdom, wisdom is very different in every situation. Knowledge and wisdom could be understood to be the two halves of the human mind. Psychologists talk about the left brain and the right brain, the yin and the yang, order and chaos. A shout out to the feminists in the room, as you may know. In the Old Testament, it is lady wisdom that calls out into the streets. While the character of God that is order in creation is attributed to the father, it is the lady wisdom, the motherly aspect of God that gives divine discernment to all of humanity. This is why we have a hard time gendering God because of these descriptors that are given to God. It's as if he transcends gender because he is, he is two halves of a whole. Wisdom in Proverbs calls out to provide life for youths. Knowledge, on the other hand, according to the Apostle Paul, it puffs up. Knowledge fuels the ego. Wisdom, however, leads to humility. Wisdom leads one to a fear of the Lord. And Solomon asked God to give him wisdom. If you could ask God for just one thing today, for just one thing, for what would you ask God? In our Western culture, particularly in here in the West, we have historically lifted up knowledge as the primary pursuit of the intellect, and there are historical reasons for this. I'm going to take us back to the Enlightenment. Do you remember the Enlightenment? Do you know about the Enlightenment? The, Enli the Enlightenment is a, t is a label that is given to the time period roughly of the, 16th, or of the 17th and 18th centuries. So much happened during this time span that we consider the Enlightenment. The American Revolution that helped prime the, prump, prime the pump for the French Revolution. The Scientific Revolution happened in the, Enlight in the Enlightenment. And the Enlightenment was very much set up by the Reformation, Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, the translation of the Bible into the common language of man, into German. We don't talk enough about the printing press, but I'm telling you right now, the printing press cha fundamentally changed Western society. All of a sudden, you have the dissemination of information, of knowledge into the hands of common folk. Literacy rates started to skyrocket because people actually had something to read. Before the Enlightenment, knowledge was limited to, in many ways, those in the aristocracy, those who were rich, those were the ones that were being educated. Uh, but as a result of the, the Enlightenment, common people started to be educated, started to learn, started to learn more about the sciences and uh, things that were not just necessarily observable to them. As a result of the Enlightenment, we in the West recognized that knowledge, this is very important, knowledge was the key to power. It was during the Enlightenment that the traditions of family, faith, and culture faced really great scrutiny as far as looking at any period in history. As once exclusively held knowledge was being distributed freely to common folks, and the lie of the Enlightenment is this. Here's the lie of the Enlightenment, of the, kind of that time period of our civilization. That empirical knowledge, that knowledge that could be gained from scientific observation, the lie was that empirical knowledge could lead to ultimate truth and freedom, or that it would lead to ultimate truth and freedom. And there were and there are many Christians and non-Christians throughout history that have believed that myth. Here in the West, our understanding of God and the highest pursuits of mankind flowing out of enlightenment all centered around the pursuit of knowledge. Just look at education. I mean, look at seminary. 
I've been to seminary twice, I often joke to, joke to people, joke with people. And seminary ought to be about teaching people about how to relate with a God that cannot be pinned down by empirical data, but you've got to get kids, you've got to give kids grades, right? So you have people getting A's in seminary that have no ability to discern what's going on in the world or to relate with people because that's not, you can't grade people on that stuff, folks. You know what I'm saying? It's crazy. But our whole educational system, it's very, it's very Prussian. I mean, this is not about educational theory, but you just, you know this to be true. We grade people on their ability to retain knowledge. Descartes' famous expression, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am, lifted up the rational human mind as the most valuable asset in this life. The work of the empiricists and the scientists and the enlightenment turned civilization to chase after knowledge as the key to fixing whatever was wrong in the universe. Yet knowledge without wisdom is atheism. Let me say that again. Knowledge without wisdom, without the wisdom of God, is atheism. Some people think that Charles Darwin is the reason that we have an atheistic mind in the West. Do you remember Charles Darwin? He was that young aristocrat that took a paid holiday by his rich parents uh, to the Galapagos Islands to do some research, and he published uh, what is now famous uh, on origin of species. Well, the fact of the matter is Darwin was only, was only a representative voice of his time. Many people believe that he really just ripped off a lot of other thinkers and was, he beat them all to printing, and so he became famous. But, but the flow... The, the, prog the process to getting to Darwinism was already happening within society. You see, as the Enlightenment progressed and empiricism gained popularity, the main question that needed to be answered by the human mind was, how did all of this come to be without the loving creation of a beneficent creator? Because you cannot empirically measure God. You can't know God through facts alone. But the myth of empiricism is that all knowledge that is worth knowing can be known through facts, through senses, through data. When Frederick Nietzsche declared on the heels of the Enlightenment, God is dead and we killed him, he was describing the progress of human, scientific, social, and psychological theory. Our pursuit of knowledge had destroyed our need for God. He didn't... He, it wasn't Frederick Nietzsche that, that killed God. <laughs> he was describing what he, had, what he had witnessed in his lifetime, what had happened. Now, the Enlightenment is not the first time in human history in which knowledge served as a force of temptation, leading one away from the wisdom and the laws of God. Can anyone remember... What was the very first temptation in the Bible? Do you remember? It's found in Genesis chapter 3. It was nothing other than a temptation of knowledge. Listen to this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say to you, You shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. This is deception. It's a battle of knowledge. Do you ever wonder why our news agencies tell polarizing opposite stories? It's because they're all deceptive. They're all godless. They're telling a competing narrative, trying to woo you into listening to their lies. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. Knowledge without wisdom is atheism. 
The serpent promised Adam and Eve enlightenment apart from obedience to the laws of God. And the result was a theism, a non-theological reality. Theo meaning being Greek for God. A non-theological reality not centered around the life of God, but centered around the selfish ambition of human knowledge. Can I bring this little, maybe a little close for comfort? Do you know what this is? It's a doorway to all the knowledge that the world has to offer. Millions of people, millions of us, walk around with infinite digestible knowledge at their fingertips. Yet we're no closer to God because of it. And do you know why? Because wisdom without knowledge is atheism. Do you know what, do you know what the, the, some of the holiest people I know own? Flip phones. They still exist. And you should be very suspicious of me because I carry one of these in my pocket. (laughs) I'm serious. You You should be very suspicious of anyone who you see spending most of their time doing this. Very suspicious. I want to talk to you about the Holy Spirit. I promise we're going to talk more about wisdom and knowledge. I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Did you know that prior to the Enlightenment, when Christians talked about the Holy Spirit, they actually talked about the Spirit as one primarily that gives wisdom. This is the truth. When we in the holiness tradition talk about the Holy Spirit, we tend to talk about the fruits of the Spirit. And this is good. The, the, the Holy Spirit does produce in us fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, these virtues that the Spirit produces. But prior to the Enlightenment, the early church fathers talked about the gifts of the Spirit over against the fruits of the Spirit. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, the gifts of the Spirit, I know these. These are healing, prophecy, speaking in tongues. Ah, Those weren't the gifts of the Spirit that the early fathers talked about even. And I know those are in the Apostle Paul. Uh, But you see, we in America have lifted up those as the gifts of the Spirit because of the Pentecostal movement early in the 20th century. We believe that Somehow, somehow we got ourselves to believing that speaking in tongues, healing, and prophecy were the gifts that would demonstrate evidence of the Spirit in one's life over against the ability to discern things. And so legitimately we have denominations in America that have in their doctrine things like Someone has an evidence of the Spirit if they prophesy. They have an evidence of the Spirit if they speak in tongues. They have evidence of the Spirit if they whatever but it doesn't say they have evidence of the spirit if they know how to discern good from evil. And it's crazy, you know? It's crazy. The early church, uh, I, think it's G- I think it's James that says, if anybody lacks wisdom, they ought to ask of God, who gives freely to all without finding fault, right? When the early church talked about the gifts of the Spirit, they were actually talking about a messianic prophecy of Jesus that is found in Isaiah 11. There was a list of gifts of the Spirit that are found here that I think are really significant and really interesting. Listen to these words. This is from Isaiah 11. Again, this is a prophecy about Jesus. A shoot shall come out of the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This, we often read this at Christmas time. The Spirit of the Lord... The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him. And what is the evidence of the Spirit of the Lord? This. It's this that they, he would have a spirit of wisdom and understanding, a spirit of counsel and might, a spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. You see, in America, in the land of the prosperity gospel, we have overemphasized the gifts of the Spirit, the things that we can get out of the Spirit, But the early church primarily understood the Holy Spirit to be one that gives wisdom and discernment. And do you know how that early church survived in a godless Roman empire? They prayed to God, the giver of wisdom, to provide an alternative way of living to the world around them. And the writer of Acts tells us that God added to their number daily those who were being saved, right? Now, some of you will say, Jonathan, Knowledge is not all bad. Don't you know that in the Old Testament, the Bible says 
my people suffer for lack of knowledge? And I would say to all of you Bible scholars out there that were thinking that to yourself, very good job, you're exactly right. That beautiful, tragic book of Hosea. In chapter four, God says, my people suffer for lack of knowledge. Now when, God, when he says, my people suffer for lack of knowledge, he's not just talking about knowledge generally. What he's talking about is knowledge of the laws of God. What had happened in Israel is that people had, they had turned their backs on God. In that book, it says they had prostituted themselves out to other gods, worshiping other gods. They, they neglected the 10 commandments. They no longer knew the laws of God. And so if you would say to me, Jonathan, I think that what we need in our time is really more knowledge. I would agree with you that we need more knowledge of the laws of God. We, we, we do not know the laws of God. And this is, honestly, this is not more evident to me than in this conversation about statues getting torn down around here. And I'm gonna offend some of you, but you just need to listen to this for a second. I have a lot of Christians coming up to me these days, you saying, Jonathan, do you, are you hearing all these people that are tearing down statues or bringing down our heritage? I said, well, yeah, I, I've heard about this, but I'm a Christian. I live my life according to the word of God. One of the 10 commandments is you shall have no graven images. Do you remember that one? You know what the Jewish people would do in old times when a statue came down? They'd have a party. They would celebrate because one more deterrent from following a holy God had come to the ground. That's what they did when statues came down. You see, God didn't want his people erecting statues of imperfect people all around, giving them a false sense of heritage and identity that was grounded in anything other than him. And it's clear to me that a lot of my friends are watching a lot more Fox and Friends these days than they are reading the laws of God. And it breaks my heart. We're not in this place because your political rivals are in power, folks. We're in this place because we do not know the laws of God. And we are not living according to them. In the Old Testament, God gave his people the gift of knowledge of his laws. It was the pinnacle moment for the people of God. Give them the knowledge of his laws. And then he gave them the wisdom of his spirit. These were, this was the yin and the yang. This was the A and the B. This was the right and the left. God gave them the knowledge of his laws. And he gave them the wisdom that came from his presence. Yet as I look around in the church today, what I see is a great vacuum of wisdom. There is a surplus of knowledge in our age and a great shortage of wisdom in the world today. Now, I'm not an end times guy. The reason for this is I am an historian. Some of you know that I'm actually working on a PhD right now in historical theology. I love reading history. I wouldn't call it, consider myself a history buff, but I, I love history. And the reason I'm not an end times guy is because I'm, I read historical theology and in about every generation or every other generation, there's a significant thinker that predicts that this is going to be the end, right? How many of you remember 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 88? You remember this? Sold like 4 million copies. Then uh, he didn't come in 88 and uh, 89 sold less copies and 93 sold less copies. I'm serious. This is, you look this up. This is hilarious. But so I'm not an end times guy because, it, because just throughout history, so many people have predicted the ends of the times. And I'm very anxious about that. I think uh, Luke in Acts gives us one of the greatest pieces of advice regarding end times. No one knows the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, right? Um, but I am mindful that the Bible talks about the end of times. And I read the parts of the Bible that talk about the end times. And there is one particular scripture that has just been really, I guess, grasping my attention lately. And it's in Daniel chapter 12. Uh, this, is in, this is describing a time that Daniel, the prophet Daniel, calls the end. Here it is. Daniel 12, starting in verse 1. The great prince who protects your people will arise. There will be a time of distress. This has not happened from the beginning of nations until then. But at that time, your people, everywhere whose name is found in the, written in the book, will be delivered. Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake from everlasting life to everlasting life, some to the shame and everlasting contempt. This is really similar in some ways to Paul's understanding of the end of the age also. Those who are wise... 
Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the heavens, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, roll up the seal, roll up and seal the words of the scroll until the time of the end. This last sentence. Many will go here and there to increase in knowledge. Leave that up for a second. What's interesting is that this last sentence is actually debated in translation, and it could mean a host of things. The Hebrew Bible uh, says many will range far and wide, not implying that they are going to travel far and wide, but that there will be people living far and wide, which is just the case in the world today, right? I mean, we've completely spanned the globe. Many will range far and wide, and knowledge will increase. This is an indicative of the end. The NRSV in English says, many will be running back and forth and evil shall, inc- evil shall increase because there is this sense of, of darkness or evil that is associated with this pursuit of knowledge. Thanks for, thanks for keeping that up. I want to tell you that there are, there are two things that have become evident to me in this pandemic. Number one, We live in a society that does not have a theocentric or God-centric worldview. And therefore, we do not operate in unity or in wisdom. We do not live in a world that has a theocentric worldview, so we have no unity and we do not have wisdom. And number two, we live in a world that sells us knowledge like cheap food at a cheap buffet. Knowledge is prostituted like a cheap drug. You know what Facebook is? It's full of worthless knowledge about other people's lives. That's what it is. You know how well people survived without knowing everything that was going on in everybody else's life? Just fine. They survived just fine. The answer to that question is just fine. In case you were wondering. There will be a quiz later. The answer to that question is just fine. They survived just fine without Facebook. They were fine. I have many opinions about the current situation and pandemic that I might share with you sometime. Yet I felt strongly as I was writing this week that it wasn't my role to share with you Uh, my political or anti-political views or criticisms of modern science. But it was my call this week to do this, to challenge the church to ask God to give us wisdom. You know, my question at the beginning, if you could ask God for just one thing, what would it be? It's not an open-ended question. I don't want you to just fill in the blank with whatever you would come up with or with what may seem more pressing in your life. I am convinced that the church right now desperately needs to beg God for wisdom. We need nothing more in our, in our current age than wisdom. I started by asking the question, if you could ask God, what would it be? And the fact of the matter is we have asked God for many things. This is America, you know? Uh, We've asked God for many things and the fact of the matter is we have them. With the pursuits of our lives, we've asked God for many, many things. And you know, God is the perfect judge. He knows how to give you perfectly what you ask for. We've asked for health, wealth, and prosperity without having to change our diets, our habits, or our conveniences. And God has provided a month and a half of Netflix binging on him and on the government. Praise God. Yet what has been the expense of our world economy and our godless appetites, but a disconnected world, angry at everyone with compassion for no one. I could go on and on about the evils of the world and the ways in which God has answered prayers that we have uttered with our lips and that we have not uttered with our lips. But I feel called today to beg you, I wanna plead with you to ask God for wisdom. You know what the first thing I did a couple weeks ago was when I read, when I knew that I was going to be preaching on this text, I read this text in 1 Kings chapter 3 about Solomon and the first thing I did was I deleted Facebook and the news app from my phone. I came under the conviction of the Holy Spirit that I was tracking numbers and stories about the coronavirus and political happenings more than I was inundating my mind with the truths of scripture. I'm being honest with you. I read the story of Solomon asking for wisdom and I felt the conviction of God that I had no business asking for wisdom because I was spending my day filling my mind with things that were not wise, that were just the knowledge of the world. 
So why in the world would I have any business asking God for wisdom if I was just gonna continue filling my mind with things that weren't wise, right? I mean, sometimes when you get on your knees, and this is, this is, I love Jesus' line about prayer. He says, when you go to offer something in the temple and you remember you got something against your brother, just leave your sacrifice there. Nobody will take it, you'll be fine. You just leave it right there. And you go make that thing right with them because sometimes prayer requires drastic action. And I don't know, I don't know what that is for you. But I, but I know for me, I, I desperately need the wisdom of God in my life. I need the voice of the Spirit guiding me. In ancient times, false gods looked like idols that people, that people put in their homes and places of meeting. In modern times, little g gods look like black screens that we put in the center of our living rooms and that we carry around in our pockets all day that we can turn on with the push of a button that give us a flood of information and knowledge. And that flood of information will spiritually form the voice of the Holy Spirit right out of you if you allow it to. I believe that. That's what happened in the garden. That is what happened in the garden is that the, the new, the flashy information from the serpent allowed Adam and Eve to lapse for just a moment into disobedience of the wisdom of God. Oh, how many moments have I lapsed in the last several months because I allowed the voice of knowledge of the world to trump the wisdom of God. Amen, somebody? May we be people in these days that ask God for wisdom. Pray with me. Let's silence ourselves before the Lord. Oh God, uh, the scripture tells us in James that if anyone lacks wisdom, they ought to ask of you who gives without finding fault. Lord, we have been at great fault and we're, that's good news to us today. It's good news to us today. Oh God, would you take not your Holy Spirit from us as, as Solomon's father asked in Psalm 51, but would you grant to us the joy of knowing you, the joy of walking with you, the joy of salvation, the joy of wisdom, of discernment. Oh God, give us your wisdom in these days. May we hear joy and gladness. May the bones that have been crushed rejoice. Create, a, create in us a pure heart, oh God, by your wisdom and by your spirit, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we pray.